Well, welcome to this wonderful Stay Kind conversation with the CEO and founder of Quest for Life, and that is, of course, Patria King. Welcome, Patria. Hello, Jane. Lovely to be with you. It's absolutely delightful to be with you, and I know that Quest for Life has celebrated more than 30 years doing this very valuable work of healing and getting people to understand some of the key questions in their lives. But I first want to ask you, Patria, this, I've stolen one of your questions. Do you feel as good as you look? <laughs> yes, that is a question we often ask people because so often the interior is a very different experience and the way we appear in the world. But yes, I actually feel as good as I look. Thank you. Uh, uh, allowing that I look okay. <laughs> <laughs> Quest for Life is a place where I suppose I'm guessing that you got the seed of that idea when you yourself had many difficulties. I know in your childhood you had severe problems with your legs and you went through many surgeries. You've had cancer and had a mystery remission and you've also had suicide close to you in your family. And you say that Quest is about finding our own best answer. If we were to ask you that question now as a society, as a community, how would we find our own best answer. We seem to be suffering a lot at the moment. Indeed. And I think that question that you started with, do you feel as good as you look, is one that we really need to ask one another at the moment. What a lot of people don't understand when you're going through a traumatic experience, such as the, the fires, the floods, COVID, the isolation, uh, failure of business, having to close business, worried about staff, all kinds of issues that people have had over the last year or more, is that you never deal with the emotions when you're actually going through the trauma. And the trauma, the emotional reaction to the trauma always happens weeks, months, and sometimes years after the traumatic event. And a lot of people don't understand that. And that's why it's about now, actually, in the middle of this year, that we're about, I think, to bump into a lot of exhaustion in the community, a sense of feeling flat, maybe a lot of people questioning, who am I? What am I doing on the planet? Am I living the life I came here to live? If not, why not? What am I going to do about it? And these are the fundamental questions that often come up for people when they're confronted with what we call one of the Ds in life, a, a drama, a disappointment, a disaster, a diagnosis, a death, a disease, a divorce. These Ds that we bump up into in life and everything that second nature to us doesn't work. Um, so it might be second nature to us to isolate or to blame other people or to go into an old pattern of filling our life up with so much busyness. But this trauma and the emotions that are associated with it are pretty much likely to be current right now for a lot of people in our community. And how do we know, for example, if we are just immersed in, in this trauma? What are the signs? Yes. Well, this is a session that we often do with people on programs where we get them into groups of three and they look at what are the behaviours I engage in? What are the things that I do when I'm at the end of my tether? And people can fill a whiteboard with this, but it'll be um, I withdraw, I get irritable, I'm less tolerant, my memory's no good, I isolate, I blame other people, I become impatient. So we get people literally to risk, list all of the behaviours that they engage in when they're at the end of their tether. And when we put all of those up on a whiteboard, it's really obvious that these are all the symptoms of not being present. This is when we have an emotional backlog that we haven't dealt with. And we get people into the same groups then and they look at what are the environments, the activities, the things that I do or that I have in my life where I feel deeply at peace, where I feel a sense of connection to myself. And those are things like being in nature, uh, singing, dancing, uh, going for walks along the beach, 
being in, on, under, near water, the night sky. When we put all of these activities up, it's obvious these are all the things that we love to do because we're in the present moment. And what we need to do is to isolate what of those things are the fundamental things that replenish each one of us and then divvy up our 168 hours that we all get every week so that we ensure that those things happen before anything else because they need to be the foundation of our life. I love so that if, word replenish that you use. Yes, yes, because so often, particularly when we're in a crisis, we're running around giving out from what can become a half empty or a three-quarter empty bucket. And if we're always giving out from an empty bucket, then we begin to resent what we're giving to everyone else. And worse than that, ultimately, we end up usually getting sick ourselves or something happens um, our mental health deteriorates or we have an accident or something happens so that we can get some time out when we're so much under pressure. We need to replenish ourselves first and then we're only ever giving from the overflow of the bucket rather than giving out from that half empty bucket where we feel that the focus is on meeting everyone else's needs before we've met our own. Patria, this is a stay kind conversation. And it's at this point, I'm wondering, as I'm listening to you talking about replenishing ourselves before we, we help others replenish themselves, what is the part that kindness plays in all of this? Well, in a way, I was shown incredible kindness many years ago when I was a very distraught young 33-year-old. Um, I, my diagnosis of leukemia had just been given. My children were four and seven, and my brother had just taken his life. So, and I'd also just separated from my husband. So there were several major things that had happened in my life. And like a lot of people, I kept it all very, very private. You know, I kept a highly polished facade for the world that said I was fine, and now we know fine stands for freaked out, insecure, neurotic, and emotional. <laughs> but at that time when I was in this very distraught state, uh, and I visited Assisi in Italy, obviously it's a much longer story, but this elderly priest appeared beside me and showed me incredible kindness. And uh, he didn't speak English and I didn't speak Italian, but he... I think he said I could stay in this monastery. Anyway, I unpacked <laughs> and stayed for several months. And there was a little cave in this monastery where St. Francis used to retreat to. And I really love St. Francis because he was wonderful with animals and loved nature and nature and animals made a lot more sense to me than people did. And so he gave that great kindness to a complete stranger and he cooked for me and cared for me for several months. And when I came back to Australia and had all the blood tests and I was in a remission that was unexpected, my focus really was on how can I get my children as fully cooked as possible? How can I get them as raised as I can? And how can I do this work of just being with other people who are at the edge of despair, the edge of their mortality, the edge of grief, the edge of madness? How can I do this work and be with those people for as long as possible before I go out of remission, which is what the doctors fully expected. So I was given great kindness at that time. And I think when someone expresses such kindness to you as a stranger, then uh, we all have a desire after we've gone through our own suffering that we pass it on in some way, if we can pay it forward in some way, then that gives some meaning, small meaning to our own suffering. So it sounds like, in a sense, that kindness that the, the priest showed you in Italy was, was like the seed of Quest for Life. Would that be fair? Oh, certainly it was. I think that kindness had been something that had kind of rippled throughout my entire life in many ways, that I'd been both shown, shown kindness and had done my darndest to show it in the world, but I think when you are laid bare through your own suffering, when you 
when your suffering carves deeply into your own being and forces you to explore parts of yourself you'd never willingly go venture into, then it doesn't mean that you know what it's like for other people because our suffering is always very private and very personal. However, it does make us a better companion to be with other people who might be new to their suffering. And not because we know what it's like, because it's never helpful to say, I know exactly how you feel. Yes. You have no idea how the other person feels. But if you've explored your own inner caverns of anguish and despair and hopelessness and powerlessness and helplessness, then you're more willing to be in the company of other people who may be exploring that territory for themselves, who may be new to the grief territory, to the landscape of their own grief. And if we can turn up, and love turns up when it doesn't know what to say and it doesn't know what to do, but love turns up, preferably with a casserole in hand, something useful in hand, um, but love turns up and that's what we need. We need to hear one another's stories. I think we're hearing this from our Indigenous people so much at present. They're yearning for us to hear their stories because when, when we share our stories, we feel like this person gets me. They get my suffering. They get what happened to me. And once we feel that someone gets us, we're all ready to change and to grow. And then we enter that post-traumatic growth, which is so such a blessing for people. But until we find someone who can hear the story and bear witness to that story without judging it, without needing it to be any different from the raw anguish that's in that story, that's the place of great healing. Why is it that we often in our desire to help will say something unhelpful? For example, <laughs> that exact phrase that you mentioned, I know how you feel. Mm. What, what is that about? Is that about trying to give advice or is it, is it just sort of like putting your foot in your mouth, basically? <laughs> it's a little bit like putting your foot in the mouth. The thing is, you know, a lot of people don't know what to say when they're confronted by suffering. And most of us who've been through our own suffering are usually the people who know that it's not about what you say. It's just about your presence. It's your willingness to turn up and not pretend to know. That's why my favourite bumper sticker is my karma just ran over your dogma because so often people are trying to find the reason for suffering or it's God's will or, you know, it's the, the children's karma that their father died. You know, I think these are terrible things that people do say, even when someone loses a child, people can say, well, you can have another, you know, and they, they don't get what that suffering is like. And so we tend to fill up the space with something inane, because we're trying to be helpful, but it's not helpful. Just turn up, give the person a hug if that's appropriate. And it's fine to say, I can't imagine what you're going through right now, but I want you to know I'm here and I'm willing to listen. Well, what do you think it was initially that drew you to be interested to spend time with people at the very end edge of their life, as it were? I mean, some people find it so confronting that they never talk about their own impending death. Why mm. do you feel so drawn to this? You know, I, I think because in a way I had a very lonely childhood in that uh, my brothers were off being busy being older brothers who were sometimes a little bit bullying as well and mean to me. So in some ways I, I had a very isolated childhood and then of course you know from 13 to 16 I was in hospital which was fabulous because it got me away from home where you know my brothers were a bit problematic or one of them in particular. And that was for your leg yeah. operations wasn't yeah. it? Yes and so 
when Brendan, he told me, my, my middle brother, he told me that he knew he had to take his own life by the time he was 30. And as a nine, 10 year old girl, I'd taken that on as my responsibility. That's why I'm here. I'm here to look after Brendan, make sure that never happens. And I remember thinking, because I was very, very tiny for my age, I have to grow up really quickly so I can look after Brendan. And I did. I grew 23 centimetres in the next year. And that deranged the bone growth in my legs and landed me in hospital where they cut my femurs, turned my lower legs out, cut my tibias, turned them in, did that all over again a couple of times. So I had those three years in hospital. So I think I knew a lot about pain and I knew a lot about the isolation of, at one stage I was in traction for nine months. So I always had a, a deep understanding of what it was like to be a patient. You know, if the nurses closed the curtains and they were open this much, there was no way I could perform on a bedpan. So I really understood what it was like to be a patient. And so I went into nursing first, but I always wanted to hang out with the people who were at the edge of life. And in those days, we used to put the curtains around people and peep in every now and again and say, oh, yes, they're still breathing. I wanted to be in there and with the person if I possibly could. And I was only 17 then. So I think it was a deep desire to meet people in that alone place, whether that's through the alone place of being close to your death or in the midst of your greatest despair or your greatest anguish. So I think from an early age, um, I think I, I learned a lot about pain and being present with pain. And that made me a, hopefully a better companion to be with other people when they've stumbled into their own painful territory. What have you found is the most transformational thing about acceptance? I mean, I personally have a lot of difficulty with acceptance. I've always been used to fighting and fixing things. So I'd say I always struggle with something like that, but I presume I'm not out of the ordinary in this. Is there a secret to, to acceptance, whether it's about what might be coming, whatever D might be coming towards us? Oh, indeed. I, I think all of us can build both our inner equilibrium so that we're no longer so buffeted by what's going on in the world or what's even going on in our own body, that we don't have to be so buffeted and so impacted by, because if I'm impacted by what goes on in my body, then my body dictates my reality. If I'm impacted by what goes on in the world, then um, I'm helpless in the face of the pain of the world. So I don't want my inner equilibrium to be dependent on outer circumstances because then we're just a helpless victim of our circumstance and none of us like to feel like that. So I think when we accept, and maybe it would do us all good to know that, you know, life's a bit of a roller coaster ride and We've got no idea what's over the crest or around the corner. And so if we have a seatbelt and our seatbelt is the sure knowledge of how to care for ourselves physically, mentally, emotionally and spiritually so that when the roller coaster swings to the left, we can adapt to the changing circumstance. And I think we all need to do that right now on the planet because we are entering, have entered a time of great change where things are going to just become even and then they'll change again and they'll become even and then change again. And we need to learn how we're going to adapt rapidly to changing circumstances. How do we become truly agile, not just in an advertising sense, but in an inner sense where our equilibrium is firm so that we can discern moment by moment how to respond to changing circumstances. And that's something all of us can work on. And are you talking about, um, you've said moment by moment, so you're talking about being present and presumably you're talking about the 
um, the ability to uh, to have meditation as a companion. Indeed, I was very fortunate to find meditation at an early age in my own life at 17. And it's been a, a firm foundation throughout many uh, challenges over my life. And without a doubt, we know both from neuroscience and neuroplasticity um, that last century we believed that the brain was fixed, that you were born with so many brain cells and we killed them off with too much partying. This century, we know that every single day you produce 700 brand new little neurons in your hippocampus right at the base of the brain. And these are highly trainable to go in new directions and to go in, uh, make new decisions, have new thoughts. And so we'll grow that neurogenesis depending on where we choose to focus our consciousness. And that's something that we don't know that we can do until we do. We don't know that we have choice until we get to that place where we say, that's it. Something has to change, and it's me. I can't change the outer circumstance. There are many things in life I have no capacity to change. The weather, the government at times, the, uh, the climate, the, the changes that are happening on the planet. I have no ability to change those things. What I can always change is how I choose to respond to those things. I can react as if I'm a victim of those things, or I can choose to respond skillfully, knowing that life is a bit of a roller coaster ride, and that my job is to really be able to discern how best to respond to rapidly changing circumstances moment by moment. I love that. I love that analogy of a roller coaster and, and needing to find how to buckle our seat belts. Another mm. issue that I'm sure you come across frequently, you were trained as a naturopath. I mean, we've all had the experience of, of going to our doctors and talking about something. And I wonder, do mm. you find in your daily work that there is a, a constant battle between traditional medicine and other kinds of medicine, and I'm talking about a whole range of things here, not literally little tablets. Yeah. Look, when I was 17, it struck me like a lightning bolt when I was nursing, that in the life cycle of a bacteria, there's one particular point where the bacteria needs to have a suitable host in order to continue its life cycle. And for me, that's the point where Modern medicine goes in one direction and natural health principles go in another. Modern medicine looks at how can we kill the bug without killing the person? And natural therapies look at how can we so strengthen the individual so that they're not a suitable host? Now, that's where we kind of diverge because unfortunately, at the moment, the way medicine has developed we know that so many diseases actually stem from the microbiome. You know, we have a kilo and a half of gut bacteria in the, the bowel of every human being. And 90% of your serotonin, which is your happy feel good chemical is actually made by gut bacteria, not by human cells at all. But it may only be, you may only have the serotonin producing bacteria if you're eating a diet that they actually recognize. Now, doctors in six years of their medical degree have two optional lectures on nutrition. Mm -hmm. So we've kind of moved away from studying the elements that bring about good health and moved more into how do we treat disease when it happens. Mm -hmm. So if we were to educate people about the ingredients for health, what kind of exercise, what kind of food to eat, because food has changed so dramatically in my lifetime, how to switch your mind off at night so you can get deep and restful sleep. If we educated people about how to improve their health so that we're less dependent on medication, then, of course, we'd all be much better off. There's, there's one question that I've always wanted to ask you, and, and that is, what is the, you, you, you might have guessed I love questions and I love other people's take on how they design their own questions. I wonder, what is the key question that you've heard that people who are facing death 
ask you? Hmm. That's an interesting one because I think it's a little bit different for everyone. And it's not so much the questions they ask. What I find is a lot of people move more towards a sense of their own spirituality, which is very different from their religion, hmm. that peace, peace becomes really important to the person who's facing their death. And of course, it's hard to have peace of mind until we have peace of body, which is why I found naturopathy to be such a wonderful complement to a medical approach to palliative care, because those two things together can absolutely bring about a very peaceful state of the body in which the person can then find peace in their spirit as well as peace in their body. So I think the yearning for people who are facing their death is the yearning for peace, to be at peace with themselves, to be at peace with their history, to be at peace with their loved ones, to be at peace with what's happened in their life and to be able then to let go of life lightly because people who struggle with life struggle with death and when we make peace with life we make peace with our death as well. That's incredibly powerful thank you very much for that and the final question which which kind of leads into what we've just been well comes from what we've just been talking about you talk about this piece and I guess people who've worked with you have so much knowledge by the time the end of their lives finally come to them. I always thought it would be amazing if we could bottle that knowledge and spread it through the community so that everybody's as aware of their lives, even if they're not about to die. Do you know what I mean? Um, <laughs> I wonder, I mean, how do we create kind of compassionate communities when, you know, we don't want to lose all of that fantastic knowledge that we gain. We, we, want, to, we want to share it before we go. Yeah. You know, so much of it comes down to simple kindness, being kind to ourselves, being kind to one another, being kind to the creatures on the planet and being kind to the earth itself that if we lived with a little more respect and awe, wonder, you know, it, it's pretty extraordinary that we're all alive and living and breathing on this extraordinary planet. And when you think that your own body is outnumbered 10 to 1 by bugs that live in us and on us and that we're an ecosystem, uh, you know, it's a wondrous thing that we're even alive. And if we could live with that sense of presence, the presence of wonder, the presence of awe, that to even be alive is extraordinary. So I can definitely recommend nearly dying and then not, because that certainly gives you a heightened appreciation for life, for every moment above ground. But not everyone's going to be blessed with that experience of contemplating their death and then not dying and yet it's often our suffering that breaks us open to having a deeper appreciation for life for love for one another for presence for the wonder of being alive on the planet and how you engender that wonder in people I find sometimes we wake up through inspiration and that's many of our young people. Hopefully many of us were inspired as young people, but sometimes that gets knocked out of us on the way. And then the other way that we wake up to how wondrous life is, is through our suffering. If we're willing to embrace our suffering and let it have its way with us and force us to explore parts of ourselves we might never willingly venture into, then we know ourselves, we know ourselves in our depths and there's a strength in that and there's a wonder in that and then we can embrace life regardless of its challenges moment by moment with a quiet mind and an open heart. Well, Patria King, I am going to bottle this conversation. <laughs> Thank you so much for speaking with Stay Kind Conversations. <laughs>